Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Bingo, we're back for the two o'clock on Friday. Wow, exciting. Carl Kim, our old friend, the director of the National Preparedness Training Center, right here across the street. National in Hawaii. Fabulous. Right. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you, Jay. And, uh, and Mikey Washta, the meteorologist uh, for the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center here in Honolulu. Great. I want to be a meteorologist in my next life. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so we had Lane. We have to do a dichotomy. I mean, a, a, what do you call it? We have to do a we have to do a, a, a discussion, an analysis of what happened with Lane or what didn't happen. So, Carl, you, you look at this stuff all the time from the lens of how can we be better prepared uh, here and elsewhere in the world. So, let's talk about Lane. What kind of a storm? Uh, what happened in Lane? And how did it affect us? What is the worst case analysis? And what can we learn from it, learning from Lane, yeah? Well, I think it's really important that when these events occur, that we look back uh, in terms of what happened, uh, also what could have happened, uh, and what we've learned from that. And for that reason, our center, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, which works on building capacity for uh, state and local government uh, throughout the nation, is really interested in uh, these types of events. One of the great things about my job is I'm surrounded by smart, young people like uh, Mike, Michael Iwashita, who's our staff meteorologist. Smile. Uh, and, and so I've, I've brought Michael along to talk a little bit uh, uh, about uh, what happened with Lane and some of the weather lessons that we have from him. He has a very uh, interesting background as well, too. Mike, why don't Okay, Mike, yeah. So yeah, tell okay. us about your background. How do you get to be a meteorologist in the first place? And for the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, which is really something. You're at the cutting edge. You know? <laughs> sure, um, yeah. So thanks for having me. Um, uh, so my background started at the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, in the undergraduate meteorology program there. Um, after that, I, I joined the Air Force as, a, as an Air Force meteorologist and uh, spent seven years doing that. And uh, once I finished um, my active duty Air Force service, I joined the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center as a staff meteorologist, mm -hmm. um, you know, hoping to continue my service to the public um, in order to help build. Well, sounds like your service at the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Notice how we all roll that right off our tongue. I've been thinking about getting a musician in to help you put it to music, right, right. but that's not the show, that's later. Um, so, uh, how central is your work to National Disaster Preparedness Training Center? It sounds like, to me, um, it's, it's very central, huh? Yeah, so uh, NEPDC specializes in the nat natural hazards and disasters, uh, which many of those, or the majority of those, focus on, you know, weather-related, meteorological-related phenomena. So, it's a, it's a very central por portion of our mission. Carl said you could tell us what happened in Lane. Yeah, sure. So uh, Hurricane Lane, as we all know, entered the Central Pacific on uh, the 19th of August. Um, and throughout its lifetime, it intensified to a Category 5, which is the maximum uh, strength or intensity of a hurricane. Um, is it possible we're going to see a 6 later on? I mean, with climate change. <laughs> um, one day uh, we find that climate change actually <laughs> elevates the whole system, no? It, I'm not, I, I don't think. There's uh, any official word of that right now, but you know nothing's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the slide that we had up earlier, uh, it was showing the track, uh, basically the track of Hurricane Lane throughout the Central Pacific. And the fascinating thing about that is that it went from a Category 5 storm, which is the maximum intensity, uh, down to a tropical cyclone within the span of two days. Um, so it's is that a, fast? It's a very rapid um, decline. De decline, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, that it was the fourth storm, or excuse me, the second storm in, in our area in the Central Pacific of the season. Um, so you know we're right in the middle of hurricane season right now. So uh, it was a, you know, now that we're prepared, everyone was prepared for Hurricane Lane. Um, we'll be prepared for the rest of the season too. Yeah, I have a question about that. So we've had, we've had uh, Lane. Uh, when we talk about we talked about Norman, Olivia. Did I miss any? There was others. Um, we've seen three or maybe four already. Yeah. Um, all coming from the same general direction. 
Uh, thankfully, uh, some going south of us, others going north. None of us, none of them hitting us directly, although they, they hit the Big Island pretty badly. Um, so my question is, from the track of the storms so far this season, what, July, August, um, and from what we know about how this, how these hurricanes, uh, you know, are created, um, uh, how they generate themselves um, to the east of Hawaii, uh, can we make any predictions as to the rest of the season? Um, can we say there's going to be a number of others? Is this number that we've had already, you know, so large that it tells us anything? Um, so the, the amount of storms that we've had up to this point does, does not necessarily dictate what, or, you know, is not necessarily foretelling of what the rest of the season is going to be. Um, certain agencies uh, within NOAA and, and some research agencies uh, do produce um, what they call seasonal forecasts. Um, and, and that's the closest that we can get, you know, to some kind of um, mid or long term outlook for the for an entire season's time frame. You call them up sometimes. Uh -huh. Call up Noah. Let's call Noah yeah. today and see what we can learn from Noah. Yeah, but I, I really want us to focus on, on Lane. I mean, uh, if you go to that next slide, this is a really large storm, too. Okay, let's see the next slide. Yeah, and so. Is this, yeah, so well, we've seen this. Yeah. We've seen this slide. Yeah. Where's this from, this slide? It's been all over the news. Uh, you know, the this is a Noah week. slide, yeah? Yeah, so this is a satellite image of, of Hurricane Lane as it was approaching uh, Hawaii at about at the 150 degree latitude mark. Uh, and, and at this point, uh, I believe it was, like Carl mentioned, very large in size, about 300 miles across from, from one side to the other. Um, and also at a category four in intensity, I believe. Um, so you know, the significance of that, like Carl was saying, is that a lot, of, a lot of times we tend to focus, or as a public, we tend to focus on the track, which is the center point, where the center point of the storm um, is directed to. But the impacts of the storm and the damage that can be done you know, can expand, depending on the size of the storm, hundreds of miles from the center in e any direction. Well, this storm uh, th it was slow moving. I remember that. Lane. It was, yeah. Um, and it declined rapidly, relatively speaking, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, was there anything interesting about Lane, you know, that tells us anything about what, what, what the season is like? I mean, the fact that it was slow moving, um, the fact that it declined so quickly? Yeah, so, so focusing on the fact that it was so, so slow moving, um, another interesting thing that, that occurred with Lane was the amount of rainfall um, that fell, especially in Hawaii County. Um, and then a lot of that was attributed to its slow speed and allowing the rain showers to um, you know, be present over, over one landmass or one island in Hawaii County and, and some Maui uh, for a prolonged period of time, which increased the amount of rainfall, yeah. um, which led, led to the flooding um, and, and a lot of damage. So you start out with worrying about the speed of the winds and you wind up worrying about the uh, quantity of rain. Yeah, right? definitely a lot of secondary thir third order effects yeah. associated with it. Right. Carl? But yeah, if we go to the next slide, I mean, if you see most of the hurricanes uh, in this region start in the east and then move uh, towards us and then they come up from the, the south. And uh, fortunately, there have only been a few uh, direct hits that uh, have come up. Izal most recently with tropical storm. Well, the probabilities favor us, don't we? We're a speck in the ocean. Well, if you look at the number of uh, storms that we've had, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there's 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 quite a few uh, damaging uh, impacts that that, that have, have occurred. Well, we always we worry have... about the big one, don't we? Mm -hmm. The Iniki Plus kind of storm, right? right. Right, so if you go to our, our next slide there, uh, uh, um, actually the previous slide, uh, if you can see, this is the track of most of the storms that have come, and you can see that for the most part, they sort of exhibit uh, a, a similar pattern in terms of where they're coming from and then uh, uh, turning uh, north. I think the most uh, damaging storms have been Iniki, uh, Eva, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, dot as as well too. But uh. this this slide suggests that we we are in the center of a path of numerous hurricanes, though. 
Mm -hmm. Unless, unless it, you're not including all the hurricanes on the outs on the periphery, it looks to me like we're we're a sitting duck in in right, manner of speaking. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, and I think we brought this slide for another reason to sort of illustrate that we really are in the middle of the Pacific, and so uh, unlike other uh, communities uh, that are in more built-up areas. We really don't have a lot of uh, technologies and information or other communities uh, that have uh, experienced the storm. We're, we're on our own. We're, we're, we're on our own, and so, uh, and, and that creates a challenge in terms of uh, forecasting. Yes, definitely. So like we saw with the, the rapid uh, weakening of, of Hurricane Lane, um, once it went on the, be the lee leeward side of the Big Island, uh, that, I think was was a was a case where we like Carl was saying we don't have that much previous historical evidence of, um, so that added to the challenge of being able to accurately forecast uh, that type of phenomena or that type of occurrence. Well, that that chart we were just looking at, I just wonder, is there? And I don't know the answer. Maybe nobody knows the answer. But is there anything about the Hawaiian Island chain that protects us? I mean, about, about the topography, the mountains about the way the, the wind works or the ocean works that, that, that keeps the hurricanes away, that makes it less likely they're gonna hit us? It, it definitely plays of uh, the topography of the islands, definitely, and especially the large mountains in, on the Big Island, um, play you know, a, a pretty large factor in the dynamics of that going to the hurricane, um, mainly in the form of, of what, what's called wind shear, which is the variation of, of wind direction and speed. Uh, throughout the vertical column. Um, so for for Hurricane Lane, uh, once it entered that area of increased wind shear, uh, that allowed it to decrease in intensity very rapidly. And wind shear is related to uh, trade winds, no? Well, wind shear is just a general term for the variation. Uh, it, it can be related to trade winds, but it, it's not specific to trade winds. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, so did we hit slide number five yet? Uh, no, we're almost let's, there though. Let's go yeah, to slide number five. Um, well, well, I think the other, look, if we go to the next slide, you, you want to say something about, uh, about I think. Yeah, so yeah. this is a really fascinating picture of uh, taken, oh, yeah. taken from one of the, from the NOAA hurricane hunters. Yeah. Um, so did they you were, take this picture? <laughs> I, I did not. Uh, this is uh, from one of the National Weather Service employees. Um, but so during, during the approach of Hurricane Lane, uh, there were multiple agencies um, flying Hurricane Hunter aircraft uh, between NOAA and the Air Force, uh, which which are reconnaissance aircraft which fly out into the eye, over the eye of the storm uh, to drop uh, observation equipment and and uh, measurement hmm. you know instruments, uh, so, which so allows us. So that picture us, you're looking down into yeah, the that's, eye. Yeah, that's that's it's not up. In, no, because if you were looking up, you'd be in, you'd have, you'd have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Down, you yeah, want to you down. Wouldn't want this. That's not the place. Well, because we're in the middle of the Pacific, too, we have to send these aircraft out to uh, get uh, more real time information as to wha what's happening as well, too. And so, so, would it happen if we dropped the bomb right in right in the uh, eye? That's not going to hurt <laughs> no. or help, is it? <laughs> No. Just, okay. just wishful, right. wishful thinking. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so we're ready for slide five. One of the big impacts was the was the flooding that occurred because of the size of the storm, how slow moving it was, the amount of moisture that it picked up, the record setting amounts of rainfall, and something like over 50 inches of rain in the Puna area, which caused a lot of uh, damage. Uh, 50 inches homes. is huge. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. four feet of rain right. in, a, in a, like one day or something. Right, right. Yeah, right. yeah so just for comparison, that's, that's how much 50 inches of rain is what a Hurricane Harvey produced in Houston, yeah. right? right? Right, so that led to, you know, flooded roadways, caused landslides in, uh, in areas. And so part of what we've been doing is estimating the impacts uh, on the infrastructure, uh, not just uh, um, on the roadways, but uh, to homes and businesses. Uh, and how, how do you do way. that, Carl? How do you, how do you make that estimate? Well, we uh, collect information on the damage claims and uh, ah, the request really? for assistance. Ah. And in fact, for one of the things is for debris removal, uh, I think uh, Michael told me this morning it was 148 or 49? Yeah, 149. 149 requests for uh, debris removal from this. What? Just in Hawaii County uh, right. through uh, a, a volunteer organization called Crisis Cleanup, 
um, which does all the most of the coordination for uh, disaster and debris recovery uh, work order requests uh, for any kind of natural. And usually area. that's roadways, or is that more than roadways? It's mostly no. private property. Yeah. Mostly oh, private. take it off my front yeah. lawn, sort of thing. And, yeah. and what's good about uh, Michael is not he's just he's a meteorologist. He's a he's a Big Island boy, and so he's got a lot of. Why didn't uh, you say that before? Well, I was trying you know, to, but I, it's hard Island to get a word in edgewise. With <laughs> You're a very <laughs> different person, Mike. We right. know that. We know that the Big Island, you know, and we always say it's the water. It's the water on the Big Island. It makes people different, yeah. I could name names. Let's take a short break to think about that. We'll be right back in one minute. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing Two Truths and a Lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Mike. Okay, we're back. We're live with Carl Kim and Michael Iwashita from the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. I actually committed that to memory a long time ago, yeah. Carl, when we first met. That's right. <laughs> so, what was the worst case analysis? What could have happened with Lane? Yeah, what we did was a plausible worst case uh, assessment before the storm uh, occurred. And we use this damage estimation program called HAZUS. It's, it's put out by FEMA. And so what we did was we simulated if a Category 1 storm uh, hit uh, Oahu. What are the uh, winds in a Category 1 storm? So for a Category 1, uh, we're looking at winds of 74 to 95 miles per hour. That can rip the, the, and that's the, the roof off your house. It could, right? and, and that's sustained wind, so there, there could be gusts that are much stronger than that. Mm, okay, right. right. So if we bring up the next slide, we'll, we'll show you the track that we sort of simulated. The actual track is it sort of veered off to the west, but what we did was that it, it continued uh, uh, north uh, so that it struck Oahu. And then with that, uh, we estimated uh, the damage that could occur, if I could have the next slide up. And so what, what this uh, program allows us to do is to estimate the number of households that would be uh, displaced or, or uh, affected, the numbers, thousands that would be requiring uh, temporary shelter. We also estimated the amount of debris uh, generated by this Category 1 storm, which would be about 459,000 tons of, uh, of debris, and then the damage to thousands of buildings, and then the costs associated with this, which would be uh, upwards of $3.8 uh, billion. Uh, billion dollars. Yeah. And I have to say, by the way, that we only looked at the wind impacts. We didn't really, because we didn't have time, we, did, we, we, we were continuing to do this, we didn't really look at the storm surge or what would happen with heavy, heavy flooding on Oahu. Which secondary would, effect. Well, well uh, they would cause uh, these numbers to really increase yeah. even, even more. Yeah. Uh, so this was just our sort of a first pass, lower but you know, you know, honestly, case. Carl, why, why, why do I care? Why do I care? Because this would never happen to me it would never happen to my house. It's going to happen to someone else, your neighbor's <laughs> house. But again, everybody but me, maybe. Well, you know, I think you know, the reason I ask you that silly question is because a lot of people think that way. Right. Not going to happen to me. Right. 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 
Well, again, part of what we do is we focus on preparedness and the things that we can do, and we can actually you know, improve our detection, warning, alert systems, improve our public communications. We can try to make our buildings stronger and more robust, but we also need to work on recovery planning, and that's a big focus of our National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Uh, and so we've been working on recovery planning, not just here in Hawaii, but in the Gulf Coast, in Puerto Rico, in other communities that have mm -hmm. experienced mm -hmm. these disasters. That's interesting because some agencies, like Sea Grant College up there at UH, yes. you know, they're focused on uh, how to hold your house together, how to mm -hmm. make um, you know, structural improvements so it doesn't come apart in high winds. Um, and you're in a different place on this. Well, Sea Grant is doing some more interesting work too on reconstruction as well too. They have an interesting project on, mm -hmm. on that as well too. And I think it, you, there are things that we can do to not just make our homes you know, stronger and safer, but better sighting and location yeah, outside yeah. of the hazard zone or the or the red. But you're going to focus on how do you pick up sticks? How do you yeah, put Humpty do you do back recovery? together again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we we know quite a bit about recovery. If I could have the next slide, so we we developed for FEMA uh, a FEMA certified recovery class that really focuses on not just the government programs that are available from FEMA, from HUD, from Small Business Association uh, Administration, and and so forth. But really, the ways in which uh, the government, the communities come together in this. And, and what we do know about disasters recovery is that it happens in stages. There's stuff that you have to do in the immediate time. You have to clear the roads. You have to clear the debris. You have to restore you know, the basic infrastructure. There's also mid-range concerns you know, that involve getting our systems back up and going, getting our businesses uh, working again, get opening our schools and, and other businesses. And then as the graphic shows, there's also longer term concerns about redevelopment and recovery yeah. so that we're building back better, stronger in a way. And so, uh, and, that, and that can, for big disasters, take many, many uh, decades. And so this is part of what uh, we've been working on at our center uh, and uh, developing uh, these sorts of courses. Uh, and we started doing some of this work in Waikiki, and I think I told you about our Waikiki pre-disaster recovery project that we did with the Waikiki Business Improvement uh, District Association and other partners uh, in Waikiki with the, with the city. We're also working with the, uh, the city's Office of Climate Change, uh, Sustainability, and Resilience to uh, improve uh, disaster risk reduction. And, and, and one of the things that we found out was one of the big gaps, actually, uh, is with uh, small businesses as well, too. And so if I can have the next uh, slide up. Uh, if you look at um, what happens to small businesses uh, after disasters, immediately after disaster, something like 40% of small businesses uh, won't, won't reopen. They basically fail. Uh, and then a year later, something like an additional 25% more uh, businesses are subject to failure. And then this failure rate is really high. 75% you know, fail after three years if they do not have uh, continuity plans. And so that really is the importance of What's a of continuity planning. plan? Uh, insurance? Well, part of it is insurance, but part of it is really having backup systems, having your data stored away, having uh, worked out agreements. So we've been focusing a lot on supply chains and uh, in the management of, of, of resourcing. And, uh, and, and we think this is a really important uh, topic. And if I can turn to well, our well, final why are, you, slide. why are you focusing on small business? Let me, if we get to my final slide here, you know, this is a, this comes out of our, our training course. You know, uh, really, the uh, small businesses are are, are are really make up a large proportion of uh, the total uh, employment that, that we have, and what we know is that uh, ninety nine percent of all companies are small businesses. And they uh, uh, employ something like 50% of, uh, of, of all employment. 
And then the amount of uh, losses uh, for a small business on a, a daily basis could be as much as uh, three thousand uh, dollars per day, or for uh, a middle-sized business, twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars. And and uh, as a consequence, that has a big impact on livelihoods, on jobs, on uh, so forth. And and from our research, what we found were the big, large corporations. You know they can kind of take care of themselves because they have other uh, branches or uh, other hotels or other located in other uh, jurisdictions where the small business is, really we need to, to, to work on. So, uh, so we've been working together, and Mike, Mike, Michael's been one of our lead developers on this uh, to try to increase the resilience, the capacity to recover after uh, disasters especially for small businesses. And so that's, that's part of our capacity building work that we're, that, that we're engaged in. Mm -hmm. More slides? No, I, I, that's it, and so. Okay, yeah. okay. I do, I do have some questions. Sure. <laughs> so, <clears throat> problem is that most people are complacent about this. They don't follow it, they think it's gonna be somebody else's house, somebody else's small business, somebody down the block, but not them. They firmly believe that. And so they don't do anything. And you can tell them all day long and they still won't do anything because they think that for some you know, reason, God will spare them mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that's the way they operate. Uh, and I think we haven't had enough bad, bad weather to really make them think about this. You know, I mean, I hate to say it, but we, we need some hard lessons mm -hmm. before people get the right idea. But the, 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 what I wanted to ask you guys is this. You know, you're, you're preparing for disaster, uh, and you're preparing to rebuild the, uh, uh, the community, the economy. This is not easy, because the, you know, the community, the economy took decades, years, centuries to build the way it is at the moment before a bad storm. Um, and now you say, well, we have to rebuild all the essential elements of that in, in a matter of hours or days, not so easy. And, and, and we know that government, federal and state, um, may not be just as we expect them to be. Uh, we know that people may not be as responsive as we hope they will be. So you have a kind of reverse government situation. How do you get the government to get in there and do all the things in your plan? Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it is government, but it's beyond that. It's households, it's businesses, it's the whole community. And part of what we did, in part, to really look at what could happen is, you know, we went to Puerto Rico and we studied what happened uh, after Hurricane Maria and how long the recovery took. And it's not just a matter of weeks or months, it's gonna take years. We can actually look back in time at what happened with Iniki, how long it took uh, Kauai to recover after, after that storm. And so part of what we've been trying to do is extract the lessons uh, from communities, similar communities, island communities. Uh, we also face another challenge or hazard that we're located in the middle of the Pacific uh, and we're not connected by super highways or rail lines and it takes a lot more time for goods and equipment and So your uh, plan services. is gonna be real different than San Diego's plan. Yeah, I think it has to be. I think, I think it has to be and, and I think these events these near misses, they're wake up calls for us and they're opportunities for us to really focus on ways in which we can uh, build resilience and uh, increase our capacity to not just you know, weather a storm, to survive a storm, but uh, if there is damaged infrastructure, damaged homes, damaged businesses and uh, how we can rebuild them. And so that's part of what uh, our focus is and so uh, you know, uh, I, I do hope that we can come on the show and talk about our work in Puerto Rico. I was. I want to uh, do that. Yeah, yeah. Because Puerto Rico is a fascinating uh, a lesson. Well, one last one last question before we go, and that is uh, my my point about reverse government. You got to get government to do this stuff. Government has theoretically the governmental power to do things, and it has the agencies, police, fire, what have you, all kinds of agencies, health, whatever. Um, how do you, and, and your plan has undoubtedly calls for action in all of those areas, and it calls for individuals, I don't know if you name them, uh, to come forward 
and be empowered and take certain specific actions they have never taken before, never taken before, and do those things efficiently and with the right attitude and frame of mind to save people and to rebuild the society. Uh, how can you cover that in a plan? It must be hard. How do you address that? Well, that's other, an, another misconception. I, I, I really believe that for response, for relief functions, we really do rely heavily on government, emergency services, and so forth. Uh, I don't want to take away from that important role and mission. But when we talk about redevelopment or reconstruction or rebuilding, that really involves, it involves much more than government. And actually the amount of resources that go towards rebuilding uh, businesses and homes and really comes out of savings, it comes out of insurance, it comes out of uh, other uh, sources uh, beyond, beyond government. And so that's a really important thing to, to really uh, uh, recognize. Mm. Let's go to advice to the public. Michael, as a meteorologist in this, you know, uh, in the planning process and the analysis of Lane and other storms, what would you advise the public to think about from your point of view? Um, so there's a few things, uh, you know, for in, in the in the event or in the heat of all of everything, as this you know the storm and is approaching, um, we should, as a public, you know, heed the warnings that are put out, the, the advisories and the warnings, and listen to the information that is being broadcasted, and um, take appropriate actions that uh, you, you know is in order to protect life and you know, for personal safety and property. Um, but in the longer term, like Carl was talking about, I think another uh, important factor is is just the fact that, you know, it's going to affect the whole community, so we're in it as a whole community. Um, so, so when, you know, in, in a situation where it may not directly impact yourself um, as an individual, it's going to impact people that you know. Um, so just keep that in mind. And, you know, it, when that does happen, if, it, if you're not directly affected, you know, def definitely be ready and plan to uh, help out your neighbor, help out your friend, or help out someone in need so that we can all recover, rebuild, uh, you know, faster and in the best way possible. Care for each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to do that when you're, you're an extremist and you don't have water or food, but you can still care for each other. There, there's always a way. <laughs> okay, Carl, what do, you, what do you advise? What do you advise people like... Um, you know, small businesses, what do you advise people like big businesses um, to do to have the right approach to this? And, 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 and what should they expect to hear from you? What should they be looking for to hear from you? Well, we really believe in doing risk and vulnerability assessments, you know, looking at what your risk and exposure is, you know, where you're located, and then also look at what happens when these disruptions occur when you have a power outage. How many days can you go without power? How many days can you go without customers? How many days can you go without uh, other uh, infrastructure services? And what are your backup plans? And so we've been looking at different businesses and examples that have survived and what are ways in which they can become resourceful uh, and, and be uh, engaged with the community to continue to uh, uh, to, to, to conduct their business, to keep their employees, to, uh, to survive uh, in the time of uh, disasters. And so, and I think uh, Michael has really hit on an important part of it, that we really do need to think about social capital as well as uh, financial capital uh, and how does all of that work. And so these sorts of trust relationships are also uh, very important. Yeah. Why, do I, why do I feel that we're going to be knowing you better and more over the the years to come. You're going to be very popular, you guys, and you're going to be central in our lives more than before. Uh, Carl Kim, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Uh, Michael E. Washta, National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Thank you very much. Let me add at the end here that oil and vinegar in your refrigerator is not going to replace water, okay, in times of crisis. Thank you very much, yeah. Carl. Well, thank you for having us on your show. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thanks. Aloha. Yeah.